Hello, Yes But Why listeners. This is your host, Amy Jordan. Welcome to Yes But Why, episode 272, my wild conversation with the hilariously funny Rachel Mason. But first, let's talk about our sponsors. Yes But Why podcast is sponsored by Audible. Sign up today for your 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why. When you sign up, guys, you get a free audiobook download as well as access to hundreds of books and podcasts. There's just so much. Everything that you're looking for is there. And if you're ever like, I'd like to read, but I just don't know what to do, there's also great suggestions. So it's a great way to get back into reading. I know it's really helped me. Go now to audibletrial.com forward slash yes, but why to sign up and get your account today. Yes, But Why podcast is also brought to you by PodcastCadet.com. PodcastCadet.com is the company that my husband and I run to help podcasters. We just got back from Comic Palooza. Oh man, I really miss talking in front of an audience. It was so good. <laughs> I had an amazing time connecting with the other podcasters from Houston and consulting with newbies who are looking to start new podcasts. We just want to help people start or improve their podcasts. So please contact us at podcastcadet.com and mention code YBY20 to get 20% off the first service or workshop you buy. We can't wait to meet you. Podcastcadet.com. <laughs> yes, but why podcast is also brought to you by True Hemp Science. True Hemp Science is our Austin based resource for vegan friendly whole plant extract CBD oil. Check out True Hemp Science to see all the CBD products available to you now. Use code YESBUTY7 to get 7% off your order of $50 or more. You get all the therapeutic goodness of CBD, plus you'll get a free packet of two yummy CBD edibles with your order. Mm -mm. TrueHempScience.com this week on Yes But Why, I talked to Rachel Mason, a veteran improviser and teaching artist of the famed Chicago improv scene. Rachel was an absolute joy to talk to. She opens the conversation by telling me she was a witch that was burned at the stake, and the hilarity continued from there. You're going to love it. She was so fun. I now present to you Yes But Why, episode 272. Rachel Mason is a witch, a jerk, and a nerd. And hey, I swear, she calls herself a witch, a jerk, and a nerd multiple times in our conversation. This is how she described herself to me. <laughs> Enjoy this week's episode. I'm Amy Jordan, and this is Yes, but why podcast? Yeah. I was a witch who was burnt up the stage. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Of course. I've guessed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I feel I mean, like this I'm, is going to go well. <laughs> I'm ready whenever you are. I All guess. right. Great. Let's do it. So my first question is about you as a child. What was your vibe as a creative kid? What were you doing? Were you making puppets like your boy or were you, you know, dancing in the moonlight with the other witches? Uh, all of those things are the same thing to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like putting art where there was none before is magic. And right now, frankly, it's an act of revolution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like I was coloring and writing and drawing and then poetry and then the puppet show stop motion Barbie movies way before robot chicken. Oh, like, I mean, so I come from a creative family. So it was sort of like, like, like literally descended from opera singers. And my mother was a music teacher and my brother saying if you want to know anything about me here it is in one sense my brother was a boy soprano with the metropolitan opera oh wow and the first time the lights went up like i don't know if you've ever sat at the met when the lights go up you're like this is the greatest thing ever i want to go there i want to go there 
So I decided, like, I wanted to start to audition for things, too. And me and my sister auditioned for things. And our parents are great. The kind of kid I was was the kind of kid who my dad could be like, you know, like, give me a signal. And I'd know to do my Mae West impression. Yes. Yes. Put me up on the Greek diner counter and be like, do you Mae West? Or me and my sister would do like who's on first or something dumb or choreograph an entire dance to um her name was lola yes she, like acting everything out oh know? my god i loved it i definitely had my own dance routine to copacabana for sure mine was gloria <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> gloria <laughs> And then I like, I, you know, plays and singing and my family could sing in harmony. And then high school plays, most dramatic audition for Annie on Broadway, uh, like was getting serious. Um, and then I went to a liberal arts college where I discovered improv. Um, <laughs> and because I could already sing and I had had a sense of timing like improv to me was like, oh, a director and writer aren't going to tell me what to do. <laughs> right? Like, I think I can do this. <laughs> and that freedom to put art where there was none before and knowing my friend was going to yes and me, like that was the greatest thing ever. I like that uh, you wanted to do improv because you were like, I don't want a director to tell me what to do. I like the idea that you got into improv with a sense of control. Cause that's, that's going to serve so, you well with improv. <laughs> I, my shitty, my awesome, incredible little arts college <laughs> was about an hour from Manhattan, hour and a half. It should be three hours, an hour if you drive like an asshole. <laughs> so we had, we did Chekhov with like Chekhov's granddaughter and we did Suzuki with Tadashi Suzuki. And we did devised theater with Anne Bogart. So like improvising to tableau. So when I got to Second City, I was like, I think I know how to do this. Like that line is funny and you want me to re-get there. Like, give it to me. I know how to like, like, you know, improv for actors is like, you know how to do all these things. Now here's how to use it to like, for good, you know, to like <laughs> create, you know, and then there's also acting for the improviser, which is like, you are funny and you have a great sense of timing, but if you could just commit and like play a character. So like, I feel like I had the like best of both worlds of that, yeah. like an ability to like pull from a bag of tricks while also being open to whatever the hell was going to happen. Yeah. That is fun. That is really great. Now, did you feel like when you went when you went to your liberal arts school, uh, which I believe we've established wasn't like your favorite experience? Um, did you go for theater? It's the fucking best, dude. Oh, okay. You called it my shitty liberal arts school, and I didn't realize well, that was a term I'm of a, endearment. Like I'm a, no, it is. <laughs> I'm a gross white woman talking about her liberal arts education. Oh well, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I don't. I'm like, what? Tell me a college. If it's not for science, then isn't it a liberal arts college? Like, if the it's not like a direct to, medical right. school, like, I, right. I don't know. Well, it's a, well, like one of those like hippy dippy small liberal arts colleges. Where'd you go? Did you go to Sarah Lawrence? <laughs> I was not allowed to go there because there was a, a hate crime. So, the two biggest fights of my life okay. with my mother about me not getting to go to the New York high school for the performing arts, oh, no. which is where fame happened. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. And then my second biggest fight was me wanting to go to Sarah Lawrence with my father, because when we are there an elegant, like script, somebody had written on the admissions building straights go home. <laughs> And my father was like, get the fuck out of here. And he I'm like, dad. Like, they told me to, They, Rachel. They told me. And they were me. so progressive. They really acted like it was a hate crime. Not like it was the funniest fucking thing that ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you get to a certain age, things stop being funny. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. We'll get there soon. You know? 
It's rough. Like, it's hard. It's not funny anymore. I don't know. <laughs> I guess straight to go home. I think that's hilarious, but. Exactly my point. I also was like, I would have been like, dad, this is the opportunity for me to tell you a little bit of something about myself and be like, what? Be like, all right, come on, let me go to the school. I tell uh, this story all the time, but I'm going to tell you like, <laughs> you know, in comedy, we're like too soon. Yes. Too soon. Comedy, uh, comedy equals tragedy plus time. Mm -hmm. So by like transverse properties, <laughs> that means a trauma must have occurred for us to be able to laugh about it now. Mm. People are like, how do you make fun of 9-11? And I was like, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm a New Yorker. I lost two people that day. My father had to walk home over the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, <clears throat> I was in New York maybe three, four, maybe even two days later. And I see a guy with a T-shirt on the thing. And I, it's like the I love New York. And I'm like, I'm home. I want to support my city. I'm going to go get one of those T-shirts. And that guy turns around and he is holding a T-shirt. And instead of the heart, it is a plane. <laughs> and it is crashing <laughs> into the NY. And I have never laughed so hard in my life. Because <laughs> I was like, that is the epitome of too soon. <laughs> and, and you had a guy. That you could be like, I got this idea. And they were like, all right, Charlie. And like made them that fast for him. Right? Whoop. That's the, that truly is the beauty, in my opinion, is the effort that was made and the guys who like had I to screen print that. Like, yes. There was some people one. late night in a warehouse like, on yes, September 12th on that being like, this doing, is like, going to go amazingly. Heart, oh, right, my God. Exposure. Oh, this looks so good. I'm a genius. <laughs> <laughs> like, if I wore that T-shirt right now, I think I'd get beat up. Um, You think you'd get beat up if you wore, like, a 9-11 joke? Thing? No, <laughs> I do. no. I do. No, I don't oh, think so. I think we're ready for that. Masks. People beat each up over masks. Masks mean so much more than that. I, I mean, I loved, uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying that 9-11 wasn't a big deal, but I'm saying like masks are drawing people's like fam, ripping people's families apart in a like ridiculous, ridiculousness is at an all time high is what I mean. Comedy and is uh, doing very bizarre right now. And Nobody I, wants to deal with reality. Right. Which is why I feel like the idea of that joke of the 9-11 joke might actually hit now. I love that we're 10 minutes into this and we're already making 9 11. This is, it's good. It's my gallows good. humor knows no bounds. <laughs> we, I grew up in my family, aside from being opera singers, right? One side of the family, the other side of the family is funeral parlors. Oh my God. So when you were a little kid and you were like hanging out the funeral parlor for the day and there was a body and you were scared, they'd get all the kids together and have them all tell jokes. And the one with the funniest joke would go down and tell the body to like, <sighs> send them off with a laugh oh oh my gosh oh goodness mm -hmm. go down and tell the body i feel like that would be a deep incentive not to tell the funniest joke i'd be like oh no oh no you always wanted to win because the old man would be like hey go kid it is awesome that's part of like my upbringing around this dramatic family like i would be downstairs doing may west and my brother and sister would already be up in bed yeah like i could stay up late if i can make those old men laugh oh that's true you know when you mentioned your parents getting you to do impressions i was <laughs> like that too my mom was political and she would have like parties dinner parties at our house for you know this guy or that guy or you mm -hmm. know this committee or that, that committee and because of that I was allowed to stay up just to actually, let's be clear. At first I snuck out and they'd find me in the center of a group of adults entertaining them. And they me were like, too. get to At bed. The bar. But then At the bar, one time I fell off a stool and Mario Cuomo caught me. <laughs> I can't. I feel like I heard that story, but it went differently. So I'm glad it worked out for you. Aww, oh, no, I'm so sorry. Uh, not, too soon? I, I mean, Rudy I Giuliani, like our... it's Mario Cuomo. <laughs> <laughs> Rudy Giuliani. 
<laughs> got an invite, but yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, there he you shouldn't go. come. Looking good, looking good. Uh, that's so funny. Um, <laughs> It's fun. I enjoyed performing for the uh, for the crowd. It made me feel like I was an adult. Were you one of those kids that they were like, "Oh, she's seven, going on thirty seven"? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I once got my grandmother using circular logic, and she was like, "Go to bed." And my father was like, "She's right." <laughs> and my grandmother was like, I will, "Like looking at my dad, like I will never fucking talk to you again." <laughs> She's like, listen, it's right? adults just versus always... kids, and you know it. <laughs> adults, you walk around like your farts don't sing. <laughs> I imagine Other Simpsons. I imagine it more like the uh, the uh, sharks and the jets. Boy, boy. Go to bed. Okay. Get uh, the fuck to bed, boy. Oh, swear <laughs> word. So many. Um, so you got into improv, not at Sarah Lawrence, at a different liberal arts school. Skidmore. Skidmore College. Oh, Skidmore. David Miner. Nice. David Miner founded the National College Comedy Festival and my improv troupe. And on his own personal, like, bequest, behest, one of those, um, Charlton Heston, he, I go in and teach a Skidmore class about the history of comedy. Like he brought in all these incredible people, including the state. So like when all these incredible people, David Miner brought to my college, I would be like, where did you learn that? And they would be like Chicago. And I would be like, I want to go there. So mm -hmm. like the day after we graduated from college, my improv troupe sort of all picked up and went to Chicago together. Oh, did you guys get a van? Uh, no, we all like literally made our own way. Oh, okay. So you were like, we're all going to be together forever. And then you went to Chicago and no one ever talked to each other again? No, Anna got there first and we all moved into her house and slept there until like we got oh home. Oh my God. That's so much more intense than I expected. First, I'm just Dude. imagining it's like a family band van swinging down. being no, all we were like, like hitchhiking and like, oh, yeah. you know. Oh, those were the days. Trying to get there. Mm. I paid for my first IO class with a bag of money. <laughs> like a Ziploc bag that had change and money, like dollars in it. Just like you, like you dumped it out of your piggy bank that day. And you're like, I got it. I mean, basically I was waiting tables and doing, trying to get better gigs. Bank teller. I was always good with money. So I did a lot of like square jobs. Sure. Um, cause I think there is no glamor in starving artists. Like food insecurity is not cute when you have a child and like, it's, what do they say? Don't hate the player. hate the game. I hate myself. <laughs> so like I would work all day at the bank and then go to the theater and then go to second city and then see if I could run over to the nights and do the show there. I worked as a finance and HR consultant for Deloitte. And that enabled me to write shit tons of corporate comedy for Second City, which is, you know, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, they need that stuff. These people in these I straight love, jobs, they need a little, uh, they need to loosen up. So they got to do oh some Oh my improv. God, those workshops are like, stand up and smile. Your mother was right. Like, get, like say thank you <laughs> is what corporate workshops are. I hate them. Oh, I love yeah. them. I love get, like subverting from the inside. Like they could be watching some shitty, like 300 slide thing, but they're with me. And I'm like, mm -hmm, I'm going to help you use my powers for good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like I go in there and I'm like, Hey guys, remember those hearts you have deep in those chests? Let's see them. Let's, let's connect with those for just a moment. Shall we? I'm a little different. You know those hearts that were removed from you a long time ago? <laughs> Let's imagine they're there. <laughs> and then your friend has one and has also experienced, you know, and they're all hearts, imaginary hearts. <laughs> Well, actually, That's why they burnt me. That's why they burnt me. Sure. Yeah. They don't like that. <laughs> they don't like you admitting. Uh -uh. They're all like, what are you talking about? I'm perfect. I don't know why you're trying to say I don't have a heart. 
I am exactly the right kind Corporate of Corporate life just sucks that out of you. I don't care yeah. how hard you fight it. It's it true. is just, and we have discovered the illusory corporate world during this thing. People can work from home, five day work day is bullshit. Mm-hmm. Like the p- pandemic upended corporate. I like it. I'm going to say that the nice thing about uh, COVID's upending of culture has a, uh, is a lot to do with people are held to this is the rule and this is how it must be for a lot of things. Now, clearly not our crowd, not the improv people that we know. Everybody mm-hmm. that we know is all like, it's fine. I have a tent. I can live on the stage. And you're like, right. yeah, I got it. Um, but at the same I'm time. I'm going to split the difference and say you learn the rules to mm-hmm. break them. So you know when and how to break them. Sure. We don't wantonly go breaking, breaking rules. There are social mores. There are um, systems that must be burnt down right now. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. And the illusions are going away, for sure, for sure. We can live which our lives our in a different comedy, way. Which is why our comedy is very weird, because everything's raw right now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Everything's animated, because during COVID, you can have as many characters and as many voice actors as you need. <laughs> That's true. Think about, think about it after Nixon. Like comedy blew up into like this ball of psychedelia and we like sort of had like a little dark ages and like whatever art is about to like ferociously change again. Oh yeah. Uh huh. I think so. I mean, improv, improv is an evolving art form. So we have to like evolve with it. Mm -hmm. And because language and society are currently having massive upheavals and reckonings there's no way our art isn't going to change to reflect that definitely definitely i wondered if you had a specific uh uh viewpoint with reference to improv i'm down with the idea of the overall culture like changing and it being uh, artistically for the better and certainly like uh, almost to harken back to the 9-11 discussion that we had earlier, because let's keep talking about that. Uh, I feel like like right after that, there were a lot of like, that's what started our superhero movie boom. Like, that's why we have the Avengers and all that. The entirety of that was born mm-hmm. out of this need for uh, heroes, right? And so now right. um, I'm fascinated to see the different points of views um, that came out of COVID because it's not mm-hmm. like one, it's like with nine 11, there was like, okay, this many people were affected in a direct way. Have you watched Bo Burnham yet? Have you watched? Yes. Inside? I was going to even bring it up. It's okay. so crazy. Because yes. like, it is yeah. the perfect example it's of perfect. like the most sensitive person making a chronicle of how they feel about the world. Mm-hmm. They say that history is chronicled by the victor. Art is frequently made by people who suffer. Yes. And like this kid has been suffering since he was a YouTube tween. Mm -hmm. Like I I got to interview him once when I was the Chicago comedy examiner. Wow. And it, and it was like, um, so like, isn't it kind of your fantasy to travel the world and tell comedy? And he's like, absolutely not. I'm lonely. I'm too young to go out and hang out with even my own staff. Like I, all I do is sit with my thoughts and I was like, Oh, so like watching him evolve, watching where this special took off from the last one and how like the man he's become, forgive that. I'm not trying to be sexual. No, not at all. He but turns like, 30 in the middle of the special that I think is such a big deal. Like yes, it's such a big deal it's because a milestone. It's, it's a huge milestone. And it also is a milestone that usually in our society means something in a big way. Whereas now in, in this generation, it doesn't 30 days isn't anything anymore. Like, I just don't think that that's the like breaking point the way it used to be for mm-hmm. lots of things. But, mm-hmm. but, but for him in that moment, even any birthday, but that particular milestone one where he's like, I'm alone. I'm dealing with this. I'm in the middle of this crisis. And Having to deal happening. with it all again, being re-traumatized. So transitive property. Like think about Hannah Gadsby. When I was done watching um, Nanette, I was like, like my mouth was open. And my husband was like, what? I was like, I think I just watched something very important. Mm-hmm. 
And like her being like, my trauma becomes your comedy. And this is what I leave out. And, and here's how I reconstruct it. I was like, Ooh, she just exposed us. Yeah. Yeah. She just gave a free masterclass. You guys, I hope you were taking notes. Is forcing an evolution in comedy and kids like Bo Burnham or your friend who like rode the doctor bubble of improv. Like, you know, being able to crest that thing, which improv has always been able to do because, again, we are the most sensitive people pulling from ourselves at any point in history. We can only pull from ourselves to render how we feel about the world. (laughs) Wow, you're super deep. I like it. I hate it. I hate it. I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. You're just been teaching for a while. So you're like prepared to turn everything into like beautiful wisdom. That's the the sweet improviser in you. I am a jerk and a nerd, but I do (laughs) believe I'm a witch who died many years ago. Mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm. I do believe that like you call your scene partner, your friend, and it is a gift because it's received with love. I am like, like, I guess it's because I grew up making music with my family that like anytime we get to make music together, it is like irresistible music, putting up a show. Like, like I wasted four years studying playwriting when six strangers can get one suggestion and make up a play on the spot. (laughs) You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, you know, I've definitely seen that done not well. So I think what you mean about people being friends is required. Like you well, need to have that connection for the play to come out properly for it to I'm be gonna like be an good. Asshole <laughs> and agree, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be a jerk and a nerd and a witch and be like, there are crafts people and there are artisans, mm. right? Like. Yes. Like I can't teach someone to be funny. I can teach them to do a better scene and that might produce funny, but like there is an, a thing in a person. Like if, have you ever met Jack McBrayer or Thomas Middleditch or some other white man that I've trained to be a comedian <laughs> that has like this incredible something that you're like, Ooh, uh, uh, you know what I mean about the X factor? Yeah. No, I totally understand. I've taught a lot, a lot of people. So I understand that some people are, some people got it and some people are, are going through the motions, but here's the thing with in a team. Go ahead. The best part is on a team. Our job is to to make that person look good. You're our friend. We don't leave our friend behind. (gasps) Also, and I'm a level one teacher, so I'm like real hippy dippy about this, but like, I believe that we're all just different colors in the crayon box. And like, so we have different uses, right? So like, yeah, you've got those people who are like wickedly funny and they like make the, the good jokes. And then you have the other people who are like serving them up, like just serving them up to do the fun jokes in that moment and um and you know some people are good at that and some people aren't you know even in the idea of ego in in improv ego doesn't serve you but that doesn't mean that people don't still have them ego is born of fear i think and fear is good fear like keeps us alive fear isn't nervousness fear is excitement at the possibility which i think keeps the joy in our art form I'm sorry, tangent. <laughs> I'm into it. Take take your tangent. Um, like, I think the real difference between an experienced and mature improviser is, like, neither one of us knows what's going to happen next. I just don't fucking care. <laughs> like, I can't wait to see what's going to happen next as opposed to, like, what could happen next and what should I do? Yeah. I have learned that through reps and reps alone... Craft becomes art. Oh, interesting. I mean, you know, when you're a bodybuilder, like if you can, like you put more weight on and you do it again until that's easy and you add more weight. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Salem, have you ever been to the Salem Witch Museum? There's a lady under rocks and there's a guy going more weight. And my sister and I always say that when a man is mansplaining to us. More (laughs) weight. My sister is also a witch. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. It's lucky that you guys both remembered this past life of yours. 
She uh, was in her college improv troupe with T.J. Miller. Mm, at Sarah Lawrence. Uh, where did they go? George Washington. <laughs> sure. I was going to stir stir the pot with your with your mom and be like, yeah, she did let my sister go to Sarah Lawrence. They yeah, were like, well, well, it's fine now since we've got one in Skidmore. <laughs> so I teach improv. <laughs> my brother is a tattoo artist. And my sister does uh, art therapy for um, se- like severely disabled children. So my parents got three kids who managed to eke out a living in the arts because they were so very supportive and allowed us to fail and take risks, which is like, you can't teach somebody that like that is reps. So like when I got to Chicago, ego born of fear, like people would, the green room would be like billowing pot smoke and music and laughter. And people would be like, "Mm." and I was the one who'd go and, let myself in and be like a small pot who's got the joint. <laughs> that's actually how I've gotten involved in a lot of crazy. That's how I've met famous people. It's just like yeah. walking up to the crowd. Yeah. Like what's up? Yeah. <laughs> and you know, at second city, you can meet famous people all the time. So when you got out of college, you said, you know, everybody, you know, got into the van, went to Chicago, moved into Annie's house until she eventually kicked you all out to your own individual apartments. Anna, Anna and Lauren. Anna, mm-hmm. Anna's house. You all lived mm-hmm. with her. Um, what, so what happened in Chicago? How did you, how did you get in your first troupe? What was the journey there? I immediately started taking classes at all three places while also working square jobs. So it really was like partying till like after the set and like a whore's bath before I went back to the office (laughs) and then like changing in the cab to go wait tables. And it really was like, um, take class here, get invited to do this ensemble, get invited to do this. Oh my God, you're writing shows at the annoyance now. Oh my God, Second City has invited you to the private invite only auditions. And you've already done Gene, Baby Wants Candy, Armando. Like, you you know, like I, this is what I mean about reps and like good work. I don't think it's reductive to say if you do good work, good things will happen. If you are the kind of person people want to work with, people will want to work with you. And give you reps. Yeah. Like when people are like, what's the best first line of dialogue? I'm always like, one you would want to hear. Like, what are you, you going to do? Throw a grenade at your friends? What are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Also, like, and I what think kind you've of noticed. <laughs> I'm sorry for interrupting you. I think you noticed I don't say scene partner. I say you are a friend. Because it is a very intimate process of co-creation. Yeah. I, Uda Hagen says that every scene is a love scene because of that. And she's talking about scripted work. So in unscripted mm-hmm. work, it's this like tango-y kind of thing. Not a sword fight. Although there is parry repost, it is really a tango. Push and pull. Like, you know, when you have a real good dance partner. <laughs> I don't know. I'm terrible at dancing. Which we need to... <laughs> We need to get you out under some moonlight and go dancing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think yeah, I ducked I out of being burned at the stake. So now I'm all flippant. Well, I get it. You, you're, uh, what do you call it? A scab is what you are. Yeah, that's what I am. Line. Yep. Mm-hmm. I'm a witch scab. Um, <laughs> the middle of the stage is like where you want to be. And people who are like, get me out of here. I never understood that. I'm like, baby wants candy was like, spotlight solo kick line of nazi bears behind you it's like the best thing ever <laughs> yeah i mean i like that attention as well i 100 percent want to be in the middle of the stage um and just really have all attention. attention about me oh i don't i but like in the way i phrase it is like putting on a show it's for the audience. I mean, sure, it's a little bit about me. We're weird people who want validation from people in the dark. Like, that's weird. We're yeah. very weird people who crave that validation. So I think that, like, you're just jerking off if, like, if you think it's all about you. Sure. It's a show for the audience. 
Yeah. So you put in your 10,000 hours doing your, uh, all the classes, three, uh, three at once, huh? That's, uh, that's pretty intense to try to do them all. How did you, how did you take it all in? I mean, from what I understand, the three major schools are definitely kind of teaching a little bit of difference here and there. How did you, uh, soak it all in? Um, one day during a 10 minute scene that Mick was making me do at the annoyance when I was like hung over and like feeling like shit, I was doing like maybe three minutes, four minutes in. And I literally threw up my hands and walked off stage. And before I could get down the steps, before my last foot hit the floor, my scene partner physically picked me up and put me back on stage. And I like to say, if he hadn't had done that, like it, it would have changed the trajectory of my life. He like, I'm sure you'd get arrested for that now for like touching somebody without asking, but him physically showing me the kind of support. I never left the stage again. After that, I was like, I need to be there for you. Like this isn't me alone with my jokes. This is me and you. Yeah. Yeah, I um I had a tough thing. One of the first classes that I ever taught. Um, I feel like personally, in my own experience, I I like performing and I'm I I can do it and I enjoy it. But the thing that really excites me the most is when I teach. You know, and it's kind of just because I really love you know supporting other people to get to do fun stuff and watching somebody get it is very hot. Yes, watching somebody be like. <gasps> Like, I can make a choice is horny. <laughs> well. <laughs> Another reason I was burnt up is. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Right. She's getting horny about, like, people having a, a good time on stage. I get it. That's fine. It must have been tough in the 1600s. So many stages. Absolutely. So many yeah. stages. Um, women were not allowed to perform. No, no, not at all, which is, mm -hmm. which is tough. But one of the first cl classes that I ever taught, I had, um, it was, it was one of my first lessons in like different ages and the way people take it in at different ages. So I had, uh, a pair of 15 year old twins in a class that was mostly mid thirties. So it was like everybody else in the class is mid thirties. Together they're 30. Sure. Yes, that's true. And the beauty of them was they were the only ones uh, who would just like melt into like a character situation like one of the guys in a scene, it was like a blind date scene it's and he just fearless. played the predator and just did the noises and like moved around like the predator does the whole time and other people. And I was so glad he had a, the scene partner that he did because she was like, she and I had talked about, uh, cause all the adults just didn't know how to take the kids. And I was mm -hmm. like, guys, just play, just have play. a good time. Right. Exactly. And so this one girl, like, she Bio. really played the you. bad date. Play. Great. She like put, she was like super invested in like wanting the date to go well. And like, she's trying to like get to know the predator. Like, and I just thought it was so good. You know, it was a good choice <sighs> for her and she like accepted it. Whereas the See other, what I mean? Yeah. That's hot. Yeah. It's great when people are connected and when they like let it, be funny you know i think that's the hard thing you you said earlier that comedy is something that people have or they don't have i think some people can learn it but that sometimes the natural ability to know which choice is the funniest choice is going to be somebody who has like that extra x factor spark of like the smartest, best decision. Uh, are there plenty of totally fine decisions? Sure. Uh, some, a lot of them even work, right? Are they the best? Number one, absolutely the funniest choice. No, but they work and that's fine. And that's no still mistakes. comedy, but there are no mistakes in improv. There aren't, sure. there just aren't. There are choices you would not have made. Right. So it's actually about your ability to sort of like see opportunity in whatever mistake was made. Yes. So we learn the rules to break them. Really, there are no more rules once you learn that. Once you learn all the rules, you realize there are, there are no rules. There are only more productive moves. Yeah. And the most productive move is to listen to your friend and enjoy the moment you are in. 
as I, and I, the irony of me interrupting you a bunch is not lost on me. <laughs> it's funny because I thought the same thing, but then I was like, I hope that this, what she's saying doesn't like work against us in this scenario because it's like, we're just excited. Like also we're yeah. on zoom there. This, uh, this will just be an audio podcast, but like we're on zoom. You and I are looking at each other. So we're like excitedly like, what? but I, <laughs> You know, so that's why we're getting excited talking about something that we love. So Susan and I discovered if we start over talking, we'll keep going until our voices get all the way up here. And then we are like, ah! and like rookie <laughs> improvisers would be like, we made a mistake. And instead of like when I teach musical improv, you know, we have good timing. So two of us are going to go. If one of us backs off, that is a mistake. But if I stay here and counter every other word that you're saying, now we have an opportunity. One of my favorite things about musical improv is that idea of uh, is like when you do the songs where two people are singing at like different tempos um, mm -hmm. at the same time about their own plot line. So it's like uh -huh. this person's talking about trying to get money out of the bank and this person's talking about the date she wants to go on, but they're singing at the same time. And like the beauty is when they're still talking about themselves, but then they somehow find the theme that uh -huh. they both share. And then all of a sudden it's like, and they that's the chorus of the, uh, yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's my favorite. It's oh, hot. I do love it. It's hot. So yeah. you're kind of like, like, it's sort of like, why would we telegraph our make believe is not going well? Right. That's I feel like people do like, that all the time, though. Fuck yeah, I'll be a predator. Like, you know? and, but I, I don't understand. This happens to me in a lot of scenarios. I am with you when it comes to this idea of like, I don't need anyone to know that I don't think things are going well, right? Ever in my whole life, not just an improv, but like forever. Like if I'm losing a job, I'm going to be all like, oh, you know what? This was a great idea. You are right for firing me. Like, because it's just like, it's not going to help, right? Me being upset to this person, they're not going to change their mind. Or when somebody breaks up with you, you know what I mean? Like, you're not going to be like, could I convince you otherwise? They're actively breaking it up. It's happening. Let it go, yeah. right? So in the same way, it's like, I don't need, and the other part for me is like, improv is being made up we need some level of professionalism, right? So there's no professionalism in the idea that everything could be made up, of course, because it's wild. And that's fine. I love some wild, but we need the balance of professionalism. And the professionalism and is not letting them see through the <laughs> proverbial curtain of what's going on with you and your team. That's art and craft right there, right? I've had enough reps to be like, oh, I'm in this kind of a hole. This is how I get out. Yes. Yes. And the idea that, you know, we don't need the audience to know that like maybe the troupe had a weird discussion right before or whatever, or Isn't like this guy doesn't like that guy or whatever. That's not the audience. It's the audience should never know that. Never, 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 never. I, I tell them when you guys are doing your show. So again, I'm teaching level one. So I'm like teaching them how to be on stage, like stand with your body facing this way. Uh, Please do make not sure do this, this hand. <laughs> You'll notice that you, where you stand is near the audience and you might be, have your back to them, move out of the way so they can see the stage. How about that guys? But the other thing that I always tell them is you're going to stand on the side of the stage and we're all going to look at you. So the whole time you're watching any scene, I want you to watch that scene like it's your favorite scene you've ever seen in your whole life. I want you to be all like, every decision they have made is amazing and I can't wait to see another one, right? That's what your face says. I don't care if inside your head you're like, really, Lorraine? That's what you're going to do? That's the character? Again? Seriously? A frog, John? Again? Like, I don't care if that's what's going through in your brain. I want your face to say, like, best choices. Love these guys. Who's having a great time? Me. Like, because that's you know part of is? the show. The worst is during an audition when somebody does a pretty good scene and you're like, that kid's all right. And then that kid, as soon as they're done with the scene, is like, as they walk back to the wall and you're like, oh, dude. Oh, they're like mad at themselves. Yeah. You're not ready. You're not ready. Yeah. You're two in your head. You're thinking about something. You're showing me that you're not. Right, if you're, like he thought the scene was bad, but I am looking at different things. Right. 
Yeah. Like I could have thought that scene was great. So like telegraphing that, like just walk you don't have to be like, yeah. But like just walk back to the wall and turn around. My favorite thing to scream at students is no one paid to see you in neutral, not even on the side of the stage. <laughs> um, why are you not why are you anything. not leading like a chorus line on Broadway, like a just a loud choreographer in the background? Ladies, I wanna see smiles, and if I don't see them, you're getting whipped tonight. It's like what throw out your hands, stick out your tush. <laughs> That's what we call doing the French mistake. Oh my god, get it done. I mean, whatever. I like, like it. that's I what like it. what happens when you have opera singers. Like, the sh- I'm going to tell you about the show must go on, and you're <laughs> going to hate this story. Uh, when my mother was dying, I was a friend of mine was like, "You should join our improv troupe. You're funny." And I was like, "Really? Because nothing is funny right now. I hate everything." And they were like, "Come do improv," and I start doing improv, and I say that improv like saved my life somebody saw me in an improv show singing because that you know was my secret skill and they're like hey i'm forming a jazz ensemble would you like to perform and i was like sure give me like other fun non-reality based things to do so we put together a little set and it's my senior performance with this jazz ensemble and my mother died that morning and I'm on the phone with my dad and I'm like, I'm coming home. And he goes, nope, your uncle is taking care of everything at the funeral parlor. We're all coming up to see our final recital. And I remember being like, okay. And like hanging up the phone and not remember anything until getting a standing ovation. And I realized during the standing ovation that like the audiences need to see me perform superseded my actual ability or need to do the show. That the show must go on meant something totally different to me after that point. It's not just like suck it up. It is that audience needed that show. I feel like that is such to bring us back to like the culture change of COVID that that is part of what our job as artists is now. Is this the show must go on? It's going to be outdoor, outdoor avant-garde, like hair, age of Aquarius. It's good. Like just standing there doing clever edits and tag outs isn't going to work. And I think with this summer, we're going to see a lot more like, happening type thing stand up is having a much deserved boom right now because one microphone can go anywhere and you pixie lights make everything look exciting sure but like improv is going to have to evolve because our audiences need something like the art we want to make and the art our audience needs like there's there's some negotiation room there yeah yeah, in the um, in the journey you've been on, you've been in Chicago theater for a while, and Chicago theater is um, it's got a lot going on in it. Sometimes it's going great, and sometimes things aren't going well. Um, a lot, a couple of the theaters have even shut down. Um, some pre-COVID, yeah, some a, post. It's a you shit know? fire here. It's a bloodbath. It is sure. festering. The entertainment system was already a sewer, right? Like the entertainment business is a sewer. And I used to say that the improv community was like a little like soap bubble, a Glenda bubble floating on that sewer. Yeah. And it feels like art and commerce are rubbing right up against each other to make everything very sooty right now. Yeah. How to survive, what to do to survive, what kind of art can we make that everyone will find equally pleasant as opposed to equally offensive. Yeah. I like to equally offend my audience. Well, for a while they did, you know, for a while, you know, I, I've, I've thought about, I, I think you have to, 
things get super tight and then they react right so like mm-hmm. uh, so like the 60s the 1960s was born of the tightness of the 1950s they were like don't do this don't do this don't do this and then it exploded all over right and i don't know that necessarily i felt like the you know 2010s and uh, uh, were really that tight but COVID has certainly burst it at the seams to the point where it's like, no, no, everything is different. Insurrection. <laughs> We're having social and racial upheaval. We're having economic collapse plus a global pandemic. And then each of us is dealing with some shit like uh, I lost my job or I lost my dad. Like what is happening right now to the most sensitive people I cannot wait to see what Phoenix comes out of these ashes. Like yeah. I said before, if Bo Burnham gives me hope for this evolution. I would like to give Bo Burnham a hug. I think he me needs too. he needs a couple of hugs. And um yeah, I feel like everybody went that talking about that show was all like, it's really amazing. I really loved it. I'm concerned about him. And I was like, yep. yes, same, same. Hannah Gadsby, Hannah, like at the end, when she was workshopping it in Edinburgh, she would literally be like, here's my story and walk away. And the audience would be like. Like sometimes it would end in utter silence. Or a smattering of applause. Sometimes people would think it was hilarious, but she really was trying to give this horrible trauma away. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that uh, figuring out to go back to the idea of the uh, trauma equals comedy. Eventually, um, we need to. We will need to find a way to process. This. Not make it hurt so much. Yes, and. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. like representation and advocacy and everything we can do to like fight for social justice right now, like those, like that and our art form must advance together. Mm, yes. Well, I think that the nice thing about theater having a year and a half off is that a um, businesses that just couldn't business aren't businesses anymore um and the people who were who were able to float found a way to do it you know it's like we were talking about earlier uh you were you said oh my my parents successfully raised uh uh three kids that are living in the arts and doing this kind of thing i think that the skills of that a were born from something that you must have seen with what they were doing because they themselves were also artists sure. that were doing things and they showed you both a style of living, a way of dealing with money, a way of like, yeah, it doesn't come in every week, but we find a way to make it work. Right. And one of the things that I have found blessedly helpful for myself is yeah, uh, my work, the work that I usually do um, is way, 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 way less now. But for some reason, The skills that I had over being freelance for the last 10 years and juggling bills and doing various things was quite a helpful skill to have developed in this moment, right? And I didn't know I had to balance a checkbook. And that's why I could work as a bank teller and make real money and have my own pot when I was a struggling actor in Chicago. All right. Well, plus also the other thing too is that a lot of people, um, to toss in a little side talk about ego again, a lot of people think they're too good to work at a bank. A lot of people think they're too good to clean rooms in a hotel. A lot of people think they're too good to be a barista at Those Starbucks. people are doing it wrong. Right. But the, but the idea of that is like, I'm sorry, what do you want to do with your life? Would you like to be a lawyer? Great. Go to law school. Enjoy spending the money to do that and then do whatever you want with your degree after that. But I'd like to be an artist and uh, they don't have like an art company where I can go and and clock in and then do some art and then leave, uh, you know, when the whistle blows. That's not actually how that works. So I had to figure out ways to do it. And also like, well, this is a I studied Shakespeare. I wanted to be a <laughs> dramaturg 
a dramaturg, as my father called it. Ooh. I wanted to work at the Folger and like tell, you know, help the Oregon Shakespeare, like do it right. And instead I teach a uh, master's film students comedy and the history of satire at the Paul University. Like, who knew? Rachel, I don't know if you understand how similar those two things are. Like, those actually, that was what Shakespeare was trying to do. And satire. then everybody was like... Shakespeare was never not writing satire. Mm -hmm. And that is because up here were the lords and ladies, and down here were the groundlings. So he had to write one play to equally offend both audiences. And his skill was making these people think it was really a joke about these people. Yeah. Everything Shakespeare wrote was satire mm -hmm. because of the virtue of his audience. Not to mention the like, fact that like people act like he's all highfalutin now, but like, he you was know, a dirty witch. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was like, it was like terrible, you know, it was like the Eric Andre show. You know what I mean? Like he's like burning the desk and like kicking people in the balls. Like that's Exit what Shakespeare pursued is. pursued by bear. Exit <laughs> yeah. pursued by bear. Yeah. Bitch. If that's not written by some like raunchy stand-up comic, I don't know what is. Well, um, what, where does a wasp wear his tail? In his tongue. No, his tail. What, my tongue and your tail? Is that an ass-eating joke in the second scene <laughs> of Taming of the Shrew? I mean... Yes, it is. If that play isn't about s and I don't know what it's about. Okay? They love each other. They love wrestling each other. They're, like, they super into it. And everyone's like, it's so weird. Is Shouldn't she be mad? She's not. Everyone, married. everyone wants to say that like Romeo and Juliet are the greatest love story. And I'm always like, they died. Katarina and Petruchio get to live together. Everything shitty you want to say about sexism and meow meow, we get to put on Bianca. Like, like, and her three suitors, like the B plot, which is also revolutionary. Shakespeare, there's almost a C plot in that play as well, which is like unheard of. Christopher Sly, do you know the little playlet at the beginning where it's like a man, they convince him he's a lord and tell him how to watch the play, which is actually Shakespeare helping an audience transition from secular to non-secular. Like using this guy to educate him and be like, don't, you know, this is just a funny play. I'm sorry. I'm on a tangent. Now. I, I love, love a good Shakespeare tangent. Let's do it. I, uh, Shakespeare I, knew something about comedy that it was about like, like, isn't it funny that two Italians are wrestling? Look at this fucking sad ass Dutch dude. You know, they know where is he from? The Dunsinane woods. Where is he from? No, that's Macbeth. Where's Hamlet from? Yeah, he's a Dane. Denmark. Denmark. Denmark, of course. Yes, exactly. You're going to be sad in Denmark? Boo-hoo. <laughs> like, I love it. <laughs> All I'm saying is I'm pretty sure your education uh, suited you well. It seemed to put you exactly where you needed to be. Learning about Shakespeare, though, was kind of like what we all did. Like, I also went to college where all they talked about was Shakespeare. Do I use Shakespeare at all in my life right now? No. It's an excellent conversation piece and, uh, as you can see, allows me to connect with people from various uh, other theatrical backgrounds in a way that I can be like, see, I'm smart. I know about Shakespeare. But at the same time, the I can use it. I just don't want the reference to get past me. I just don't want the reference to get past me. I do use Shakespeare to talk about joke construction mm -hmm. and like like act construction uh and i do certainly use his iconic characters like when i'm like you know let's describe hamlet in 10 words moody right and they're like oh oh right got it yeah it's a uh, it's a good playbook to use uh even internationally Everyone had to read Hamlet or Romeo and Juliet. Everyone. In every country, everywhere. It's kind of true, though. It's true.
Or, or the other one, if I'm like, can we not describe Hamlet? The other one that works in any country is Harry Potter. Oh, yeah. They're all like loyal and (laughs) brave. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That does work for sure. Uh How interesting. Um, The, uh, I was like, no, I'm going to write that down. Um. Are you, uh, so now in the world, since it's, you know, different, uh, here in the, here in the old, I'm not going to say after times, cause I don't know that we're in the after times yet, but we're, we're kind of in the mid times. And, um, how is your, um, we've talked a lot about how you did performing and you're really active in your theaters and you're, we've established your teaching, but like now, how does it manifest? Like, how are your classes going? What kind of shows are you involved with in the COVID times? Also totally okay if you're not involved at all. Um, well, there was something you said before, like everything stopped. And what I was going to say is it didn't. Lots of people stayed online and lots of actors who are finally sort of dealing with storytelling and lighting, like the unprecedented age of dealing with like the close up. Have you ever been in a film set? You know, the director has like a little monitor. Otherwise, it's like a big wide shot. Like it's mm-hmm. like getting to see that little monitor and knowing how to frame yourself. Yes. So I think that anyone who is like, fuck it, I'll give online a chance is way ahead of the game because they can now present to a camera and an audience. If anything, we're going to have to get them to play bigger, which is everything we were trying to stop before this thing. <laughs> um So uh, I am teaching uh, for universities and for theaters here in Chicago. I um, do workshops, like specialty workshops all the time. My groups will just reach out to me and be like, hey, can you coach us for two hours? And I love that kind of stuff. Um, Me and Messing have a workshop we're doing together. Like, I'm so lucky to be attached to Susan Messing because they go looking for her. And she's like, and I've got Rachel. And they're like, yay. So we like headline festivals all over the place and people ask her to do shows and she says, yes, if I can bring Rachel. So we're like, we have a show every Friday night on Twitch, Chicago for real on Twitch, which is like Justin Kaufman. Do you remember Um, Schadenfreude? They were like huge when I got to Chicago. Schadenfreude, Kate James. Sandy, Justin, you don't remember any of them? I'm unaware of them. I never lived in Chicago. I didn't get the opportunity to ever do improv in I'm Chicago. I'm sure they came down to Austin to do a, a improv festival. I'm sure. I missed them. I'm sorry. It's fine. I wasn't actually involved in improv until I turned 30. And so I've only been doing it for... 12 years now um Mm -hmm. i was a regular theater gal like i i you know like you i took shakespeare in college and um i don't know how casting went in your college but they weren't really looking for me so i was the stage manager and that led to a short-lived stage management career in my early 20s in new york city um for a while before i was like no i want to be on stage and i did a bunch of weird open mics with people like noel Deneen and the art stars oh, before weird. i moved back to texas which is where i went to college i, I moved back to, and then um And then I got into improv here, but it Mm -hmm. took me forever. Right. I didn't know it was there to the point where like, I often make jokes that it was like, yeah, I could have gone to UCB like in year one. That would have been fine. I was there. I was literally living there at the time. I'm be honest. I probably met them around. And it was like, who are these dumb dumbs? Forget it. I won't do it. And I was like, I'll go back to my little crowd and we're going to do weird performance art. And that was lovely, but that's okay. It was a good journey and it led me to improv in my own way. Um, That, unfortunately, is my long story about why I don't know very many improv references. Um, People are always like, 
oh, this group and that group. And I try to nod and smile to make them be like, oh, yeah, I totally know what you're talking about. But I don't really know that much um, about what's going on. I would love to, I don't know, I, I would love for there to be a, a larger historical document about the beginnings and, and development of improv in the U.S. Improv Nation, um, but Sam Wasson. Is that the best book you found? No, it's incredibly male and white, but it is a very in-depth. Also, the Second City Almanac of Improvisation and Something Wonderful Right Away, Jeffrey Sweet. And then there is My Days and Nights at the Second City. And I can't remember who wrote that one, but that's a good one. What's the Something Something Right Away? Something Wonderful Right Away. That's what I love yelling at students too. It's my second year. It's called something wonderful right away, not later on when you're comfortable and feel like it. <laughs> Sounds like you have a great relationship with your students. <laughs> you freak them out, huh? No. Are you kidding? Like I am. Well, well, yes, because I was the only woman in the room for a long time. So, yes, I scared them mm -hmm. because they were not used to a woman like me. <laughs> Is it the New Yorker in you or the performer in you or both? Woman, New Yorker, smart, all red as bitch. Like, this bitch giving me a note? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, what you just said is racist. Please get off the stage. Witch, nerd, jerk. Yeah, I, I gotcha. I gotcha. It's the uh, it's the uh, trio of uh, of wildness that uh, you bring to the party. I like that. And the best part about watching him being an improv for twenty five years. I was twenty one when I moved here, the day after college, and people are like, "Oh my god." Like they were like, you're just a baby. And it's so crazy because second city has comedy studies with like, there are kids coming out of like, there are like 18 year old kids now who like know the complete history of improv and what a herald is. That makes somebody like me, like three times as old. And they're evolving this art form. They're the ones who figured out how to like use this medium for editing. And like, if this box is up, a plane can crash and then I can play an explosion in this box. Like people are, this art form is evolving on this platform. Zoom is going to, I think you're right. It's going to stay, but it is going to evolve as well as make stage performance of all. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, to that end, and the fact that we've established that we both know Noel Deneen, did you ever see his um, on stage? Maybe not. It was in New York, but I don't know when you were there. Uh, Charlie Victor Romeo? Yes. That? I saw it here before he went there. Mm -hmm. Oh, like it was the stage play of yeah. it? Yes. Yes. It being like plane crashes it's about plane crashes you witness plane crashes but they're literally sitting on stage in a like inert um thing that looks like a cockpit right but it's really amazing and they make you really feel the whole experience and they build that and i feel like and also then when it became the movie i was like it's interesting how i felt more visceral in the room. I mean, I guess it's not that surprising, that's but the thing. stage is a wide shot. So right. You can decide where to put your eye. Film is very carefully curated yeah. imagery. But I think that shows like Charlie Victor Romeo will be a similar, similar to what comes out. Something Agreed. that brings the film world onto stage also Agreed. establishes that visual, uh, that visceral action and the visual tightness. Like Hamilton. Yeah. Yeah, like Hamilton. Like with, the but with the singing. Mm -hmm. And that one's, and also with the singings. People like to be doing the singings for sure. Well, I mean, everybody wants another Hamilton, you know. I'm sure that guy's being no, tapped every no. day to be like, can you write another musical? Come on, come on, do something. Oh, he's, he never has to write another thing again. He'll do guest spots and bits and 
appear wherever. He'll be like his idol, Weird Al, and do whatever the hell he wants. Oh, well. Whenever the hell he wants. Well, but he's writing musicals because I just saw one come out yesterday that was like by the writer of Hamilton. And I was like, oh, no, okay, In cool. the Heights, In the Heights was first. He won the Tony for In the Heights, which is why Hamilton was like his next big production. Oh, In the Heights was a play turned into the thing. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, anyway, you know, he's great and everybody, you know, he can work however way he wants. If he wants to write musicals forever, I'm going to allow it. Word. Allow it. Hard, Since they came yes. to us to ask if we Motion should. Motion carried. <laughs> I can't even remember his name for some reason right now. <laughs> Lin-Manuel Miranda. Lin-Manuel Miranda, yes. Lovely artist. To me, he is like the little skinny kid on Sesame Street doing the difference between like hard G and soft G. Yep. Yep. He's on Electric Company, too, which I watch with my kid now. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, he's all over that place. Absolutely. Well, that's actually the beauty of uh, when I having a little kid and watching kids shows. It's all comedians. And I love it. That's my favorite. If anybody's like, hey, how am I going to do comedy my whole life? It's like, oh, well, what you're going to do is you're going to do hard, rough comedy in your 20s. And then you're going to get older and have kids. And then you're going to do comedy for kids that's equally as funny and probably pays you more. Squad is the funniest show on television. (laughs) Hey, all right yeah oh there's horrible such good history stuff. i would like a job writing for horrible history <laughs> there he is yeah it there's good stuff there's amazing hilarious wonderful things for children and it's a great path for comedians to go down um one time i fell asleep and i was watching rick and morty and my kid loves cartoons and I can tell he's like, mama. And I can tell he's been watching for a little while. He's holding his like teddy bear or whatever. He goes, mama, I do not like this show. <laughs> I was like, good. It's not for, you know, it's not for you. But even if you don't <laughs> sit next to your kid during SpongeBob, you have to be like, that is a terrible choice, Patrick. And SpongeBob just made terrible choice. And they will have no ramifications. Yeah. You cannot do that. Yeah. That's funny. My husband doesn't want my child to watch SpongeBob. Of all the things, we watch you terrible have to sit next things. To your kid, because you're gonna be like, no, you shouldn't just jump into a pit. <laughs> no, you shouldn't. Have you ever watched Yo Gabba Gabba? It's the freaking best. I haven't. No. Okay, you need to watch Yo Gabba Gabba. It's gonna change your life. <laughs> okay. They, like Mark Mothersbaugh is on it from Devo oh. and Biz Markey and like. The shins, like it's rock and roll and fun. And like, it's just, it's like that. If HR Puff and stuff was by the people who smoked weed for their children, (laughs) then I would say that Yo Gabba Gabba was made by the people who took ecstasy for their children. (laughs) Great. I love it. Oh my God, man. We have had some wild tangents in this conversation. We are gone down some weird topics and I, I like it. I apologize. I oh, apologize. Oh no. I love this conversation. We've had a lovely time. I've enjoyed my time with you, but I am going to wrap it up. And with that, I'm going to say my final question is about what your, we've talked about how you're working on performing and teaching with um, Susan and you're doing Chicago for real what is the is that what is exciting your creative spark right now like what is keeping the fires burning in you to move forward to keep it going to like you're going to be an artist for your whole life like how are you buoying yourself during this time there's a couple of things me and susan are writing a ton i am doing some curriculum creation right now which is always super horny to me um i am writing a screenplay right now with a writer's group, which is real fun. And uh, this Friday night show that we do is with Rich Stone and Neil Dundati, who are the Dingleberries, and Susan and I are the boys. So we're called the Dingle Boys. And our show is called High Society. We like to say it's The View, uh, but co-ed and on edibles. It is a, an incredible, wonderful, like, 
we just sit and talk and do bits. It's almost like a living room, you know, a living room form where like we sit and talk and then pop up to do bits. It's almost like that. <laughs> I love it. That's so nice. I'm glad that you have had the opportunity during this time to continuously connect with your creative friends. I know a lot of people have felt distant from their people, but I can see that you've had some nice times working with uh, your friends and that's really wonderful. And I'm really glad to make it happen. You gotta make it happen because like everyone is like, where is everyone? So you like you, you have to reach out. Like this is a time when we all have to like, do wellness checks on each other and reach out to people. Yeah. And we, Susan and I decided we like, weren't going to wait. Like we were going to like, be like, Hey, do you want to do a thing? Yeah. That's so great. You're clearly a strong woman and an excellent role model to everyone who you teach. <laughs> I, uh, I appreciate you talking to me. It has been a joy and Thanks, so much Anna. fun. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. It is my honor and pleasure. Thanks for listening to Yes But Why Podcast. Check out all our episodes on yesbutwhypodcast.com or check out all the content on our network, HC Universal, at hcuniversalnetwork.com. <laughs>